We conclude our series this morning on the book of First Peter. I want you to have your Bibles open, please. Important to see the verses in front of you each and every Sunday. First Peter 5. Now the final, the very final verses of, I'm not going to spend time unpacking these verses, but the very final verses of, of this book uh, Peter tells us that he wrote this whole letter in conjunction with or with the help of Silas, who was a companion of Paul's. Uh, he wrote from Rome. This is Babylon. He wrote from Rome and he wrote and he's joined with John Mark, Mark, the, the author of the Gospel of Mark. Many believe that Peter was Mark's primary source for his gospel. And so... Peter is in Rome. He's with these two other Christian leaders. And perhaps he's experienced firsthand what it is to be an exile. Perhaps he has seen firsthand what it's like for Christians in this historical and cultural moment. Now, it doesn't appear in Peter's letter... Uh, that, that the persecution, the opposition, the marginalization, the alienation has yet become state-sponsored. Nor has it become one of bloodshed. It has come in the form of interpersonal ridicule and loss of social acceptance. Maybe it's been economic, being overlooked for certain jobs, having to pay unfair, unfair fines. Christians are... Exiles, resident aliens. We, we belong to another world while living and engaging with this one. Now, Peter's letter is a handbook of sorts, a manual on how to do this. How, how do you live the Christian life in such a condition? And there are several repeated themes that we've seen in our journey through this book. One of these is that our heavenly inheritance is our hope. Okay? Your hope better not be in ideal conditions your imagination can come up with for this life. That is not the appropriate location of your hope. Peter makes no, no expectations that life is going to get better this side of heaven. None whatsoever. Are you prepared for that? Another thing we've seen is that holiness is an evangelistic strategy. He, he's very clear about this. There will be people won over by our good deeds. Another thing we've seen recurring is that you should not anticipate any kind of social acceptance, but cling to the greater acceptance you have as being the temple of the living God. Be ready to follow Jesus' example of suffering unjustly is another one. Remember, Jesus lived a perfectly righteous life. Some people were attracted to that. Others were repulsed by it. He sets the paradigm. So as you live your life, your Christian life, out in the open, in public view for all to see, expect the reactions to be that way. There will be some who are attracted to the church because of that, attracted to Jesus because of that. There will be others who are repulsed by it. Another one we've seen is that the church is a foretaste of heaven. Peter is so concerned for the health of the church that he repeatedly paints a picture of healthy gospel community. Repeatedly. Peter says, get rid of malice. Get rid of deceit. Get rid of hypocrisy. Get rid of envy. Get rid of slander in your church community. You have nothing to do with that. 
Instead, he says, have unity of mind, have sympathy, have brotherly love, have a tender heart, have a humble mind. This is a sampling of what we discovered so far. Now, today we conclude our series in chapter 5. Notice how it begins in chapter 5. This little word, so. So, this is an important word because it connects what Peter is about to say with what he just said. Peter finished the previous section talking about the final judgment of God. All will stand before him, believer and unbeliever, and give an account. And so Peter says, let's make sure when we are judged, we will be, have seen to suffer according to God's will. That we will have followed in the footsteps of Jesus and suffered for righteousness' sake. What will it take, in other words, to be found faithful on the last day? This day that Peter has been holding out hope for his readers. He's been talking about it often. This living hope, this inheritance that is imperishable, it's undefiled, it's unfading. So yes, Peter, I have a question for you. What is it going to take to see the community of faith brought through their fiery ordeal and to arrive safely in the presence of God? What's it going to take, Peter? He gives us three things. Christ-like leadership a culture of humility and spiritual alertness. What's it going to take for you, for me, to work through our fiery ordeal as exiles, as foreigners, as strangers, and arrive safely in the presence of God? Christ-like leadership, a culture of humility, spiritual alertness. First, Christ-like leadership. Verse 1, so I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Now, Peter starts answering that question by exhorting the elders, the pastors. And the first thing he wants the church to understand is the place of leadership in seeing the church through its exilic journey. It's a necessary ingredient for the church to make it through its exilic journey. Dan Doriani writes on leadership. He says, leadership is a paradox, a glory and a ruin, a privilege and a torment. People look for leaders who are in short supply and look to leaders whose skills are often exaggerated. People assist and advise them, favor and flatter them, haunt them and hover over them. But others suspect, criticize, and condemn. They drown their leaders and delight in their demise. It's so much easier to review a book than to write one. And it's so much easier to rail at a leader than to be one. Every step is simultaneously a step down. Few bear the mantle of authority with ease. One type is too quick to decide, too eager to lead, even to dominate and, really abu and readily abuse his power. Another sort is too reluctant to command, too thin-skinned to endure. Rare indeed is Plato's reluctant but willing philosopher king. If you were to close your eyes for a moment and try to use your creative juices to imagine what it was like for these Christians that Peter's writing to, to all that he said about the trials and the hardships, the opposition, the, all of this, I can get to a place very easily where I see a desperate need for leadership. Pastors and elders should not hesitate to lead the church. But Peter, I think, is implying they should not hesitate to do that even though they may make themselves easy targets for persecution, especially in a climate like the one Peter's writing to. Peter says in his willingness to suffer, he's standing with Jesus. He's standing with them, with these elders. He calls himself a fellow elder, and he invites church leaders into solidarity with him. So strong and steady hands are essential during a crisis. So Peter first advocates for elder leadership in the church and then describes, starting in verse 2, the manner and motives for this leadership. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. So a couple things to notice. Shepherd the flock of God. Notice how he puts that. So Alliance Bible Church does not belong to the pastors and elders. Alliance Bible Church does not belong to you. It belongs to God. 
You know, in distressing times, I find that to be a reassuring truth. <laughs> shepherd the flock of God that is among you. So it's not the job of the elders and pastors to shepherd the world. Whew. Nor is it the job of the elders and pastors to shepherd a flock that's not among us. ABC's elders and pastors are responsible for the flock of ABC only. Which is another reason, by the way, church membership is important. Because it draws the lines between those who are part of the flock and those who are not. It's helpful for pastors and elders to know who's in the flock and who's not, right? Tim Laniak, in his book on pastoring, um, a, a lengthy biblical theology on pastoring, contends it's the job of elders and pastors to do three things. Provide, protect, and guide. It's their job to provide spiritual nourishment through preaching, teaching, discipleship, counseling. It's their job to protect the flock from both external threats, the most common one in the New Testament being false teaching, and internal threats, the most common ones in the New Testament being false teaching, and how about, we'll put it as the snippiness of other sheep. <laughs> and it's their job to guide the flock. Churches are not meant to be stationary. You move outwardly as we engage in making disciples of those who are not. What does it mean for, for someone to be a pastor or elder? They're responsible for three things, provide, protect, and guide. Now, as Peter describes this, there are these three contrasting pairs of descriptors that he uses to profile the qualities of an elder or pastor. Elders are to oversee the flock of God. The first is not under pressure, but willingly. Not for financial gain, but eager to be of service. Not by harsh command, but by being examples. Okay? Pastors and elders have to strive to represent the Lord well. Lead the church willingly, eager to serve, setting an example. But it didn't take long for that to become a very lofty calling. That's why one of the reasons when you go through membership class, one of the commitments you make as a member is to pray for your pastors and elders. This is heavy. This is very heavy. Now, even if your leaders are doing all of this, Alliance Bible Church will still fall far short of what I'll call the dream church syndrome. It's a real thing. This is where you love the church you wish you had rather than the one you actually have. Have you heard of it? This would be a good reminder. For <laughs> the church is a family. Yes, that's the metaphor that's used, right? family. Now, maybe you come from and have a perfect family. <laughs> the living room is always clean. The dishes are always put away. Husband and wife show each other perfect love and respect, and the children are self-parenting. <laughs> maybe that's your family. It's not mine. Every family has warts. Every family has an underbelly you'd rather not reveal to others. The church is a family. And just like your family has characteristics you'd rather not be true, Alliance Bible Church does as well. Why? Why do we have that? Well, because our church is comprised entirely of wretched sinners. Okay? <laughs> That's who we are. And we play the part. We do play the part. I want you to remember something, though. <laughs> the church's failure is not God's failure. It's not God's failure. When the church fails, we have to learn to look past it to the Lord of the church. Remember who the Messiah is and isn't. The Messiah is not Alliance Bible Church. The Messiah is not your dream church, however you can conceive of that. 
so many people today grow disillusioned with the church because they're looking to the church to be their hero, their savior, their knight in shining armor. What are we just get done thinking about? Communion. What is our previous condition? It's dead. Yes, the Lord, by his grace, has raised us to life. But we still carry around with us shrapnel from our previous life. You know, the church is not a museum for saints. It's a hospital for sinners. It is that time of the year. <laughs> Look at verse 4. When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Now, Peter knows the unique difficulties that come with this territory. Leaders are keenly aware of their inadequacies. And this can discourage even the most prudent leader. So he offers a word of encouragement here. A prize awaits elders who faithfully perform their duties. This crown that he speaks of is the Olympic wreath that was placed atop the head of athletic victors, of civic honorees, military award recipients, and other festive occasions. Now, I don't know if that's going to be a literal crown, but it is a literal reward. And it's meant to motivate their faithfulness in the present. So what is it going to take to see the community of faith brought through their fiery ordeal and to arrive safely in the presence of God? The first part to Peter's answer is Christ-like leadership from elders and pastors. In verses 5 to 7, Peter adds a second ingredient needed to see the community of faith brought through their fiery ordeal into the presence of God, and that is a culture of humility. Look at verse 5. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. So he shifts now, Peter shifts now from talking about the duty of shepherd to flock to the duty of flock to shepherd and other sheep. Be subject to the elders. That's the word for submission we saw in chapters 2 and 3. It means to yield, follow, defer, even obey. And even a cursory glance at that marching order, you're going to realize humility is going to be needed for that to happen. The writer of Hebrews puts it this way. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. You know, one day I will not be a pastor. I will retire somewhere warm, and I will be a regular church member. And I'll be honest with you, there is a part of me that is looking forward to that day. Um, I'm keeping a list of attributes I have a file. I'm keeping a list of attributes. I want to embody as a regular church member. And I'm using my time as a pastor to develop the list. <laughs> Don't worry. So many of you embody what is on this list. One of the characteristics I want to be true of me as a regular church member is that I make the pastor's and elder's job a joy. That's what the writer of Hebrews was saying. Make sure it's a joy. And I have a note in there that says, how are you going to know if it is? How do you know if you're going to do that? How do you know if you're, 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 you're executing that? Well, I have to go ask them. Pastor, I read this verse here. It says, I'm supposed to make your work a joy. Well, am I? Do I make your work a joy? Humility makes an elder's job a joy. And even though Peter doesn't use the word humility to describe the work of the elders, those attributes kind of convey that, right? The overseers of the flock of God are to be, what? They're served not under pressure, but willingly, not for financial gain, but to be eager of service to others, not by harsh command, but by being examples. So you've got humility in the elders. Now you've got humility in the rest of the congregation as they're exhorted to clothe themselves with it. So humility is a theme that's run, running through this entire section. It inoculates church leaders against abuse of power 
and it inoculates church members against rebelling against church leadership. Tom Schreiner put it this way. He said, humility is the oil that allows relationships in the church to run smoothly and lovingly. Humility is the oil in the engine. And of course, the enemy of humility is pride. My honor, my security, my comfort, my pleasure, my power, my convenience, my well-being, my plan, my way, my accomplishments, my authority. Beware the me monster. I used to live in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I had a beautiful view of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains from our front yard. One of the highest peaks in this mountain range is Baldy Mountain. And um, you see it there. It, um, you can understand why it's called Baldy, right? Very creative name. Um, it's about 12,500 feet. And uh, you can see the line of demarcation. Nothing really grows past a certain point. Now, when you stand at the foot of this thing, and I have had the privilege of riding horseback through these mountains, uh, it's hard to imagine it ends up looking like that because there is vast forest and streams and brooks and rivers and wildlife all over the place. Even came across a, a herd of wild horses roaming through the range. It's hard to imagine that it ends up looking like that. If you're a living creature, you don't want to be on top of the mountain. You want to be at the base of it. You want to stand in its shadow because that's where the life is. Our pride attempts to put us on the mountain top where we look down on everyone and everything else. Our pride elevates us above the degree given to us. The best place to be, though, is not on top of the mountain because nothing lives up there. You won't survive up there. The place to be is low. If you want to thrive, then you want to be dwarfed. If you want to thrive, then you want to be overshadowed. My honor, my security, my comfort, my pleasure, all the mys that put us on top of the mountain actually drain the life out of us. Deprived of oxygen and nutrition, the me monster dies a slow, agonizing death. So yes, Peter, what's it going to take to see the community of faith brought through their fiery ordeal to arrive safely in the presence of God? The first thing we need is leaders who lead willingly, not under compulsion. Leaders who lead not for financial gain, but a desire to er eagerly serve. Leaders who lead not by harsh command, but by example. The second thing we're going to need is a culture of humility, a culture of yielding, of following, of deferring. We need to be a church free of me monsters. Last, to make it through the fiery ordeal and arrive safely in the presence of God, we need spiritual alertness. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. You know, C.S. Lewis has noted that Christians have a tendency to make two different errors when it comes to the satanic world. One of the errors we make is we tend to obsess over it. We take it too seriously. The other is we tend to reduce the spirit world to a cartoon villain. We don't take it seriously enough. When we took our trip through the book of Revelation, we thought about, meditated on chapter 12 with the woman who gives birth to a child and the, the dragon who pursues the woman and makes war against her offspring. So you're, you're part of a world that's groaning. It's, it's waiting to be released from, from this bondage to decay. It's trying to give birth to a new heaven and a new earth, and you're part of this. And so there's going to be conflict. You're in it. You're in this spiritual conflict. Behind, above, beyond, under, all flesh and blood evil are spiritual forces. There is a liar, a deceiver, a destroyer who hates the church and wants you to hate Jesus or at least be so distracted by other things you don't think about him 
or genuinely love him. The this destroyer wants the church to compromise the gospel. He wants you to disbelieve God's promises. He wants us as a church to backbite and slander one another, to speak ill of each other. He wants us to be cowardly. He wants us to attempt little and accomplish less. He wants your leaders to be arrogant. He wants your leaders to spend very little time in prayer or meditating on God's word. He wants us to be theologically unaware and indifferent. We have an enemy who wants us all to look at church as a consumable service that exists only to satisfy my self-defined inner needs rather than a group of people I commit myself to in prayer and study and love and encouragement. See, every day behind the scenes, pull the curtain back. Every day behind the scenes, there is a devil who is hell-bent on dethroning Jesus Christ and defiling his church, his bride, his woman. And you're in the midst of this. And it's profoundly spiritual. And Peter's reminding us of that. Now, he doesn't present us with a long dissertation on the devil. He states two things. First, the devil's dangerous. A roaring lion. Everybody in the ancient world knew what that was about. A roaring lion, a predator, an adversary, someone not to trifle with. Second, the word devil is a word for deceiver. This goes back to the Garden of Eden. Satan wants to trick you into inappropriate relationships with created things. He wants you to pursue money too much, sex in the wrong context, to trivialize engagement with the church, to treat Jesus as your get-out-of-hell-free card. He wants to play spiritual tricks on you. John White used the illustration of a piano. If you lift up the lid to a piano and you sing a note into it, you'll get the corresponding string to vibrate. You won't even have to touch it. You can get the corresponding spring to vibrate. And he used that as an illustration to say, you know what? Our adversary, the devil, knows what strings you've got. And he lifts up the lid of your life, he sings a note, and I'm trying to get it to vibrate. Thomas Brooks, the 18th century Puritan, listed some of the strings we have. In his book, Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices, he spells out 40 different strategies Satan uses, employs to accomplish his goal. Let me mention just a few. Some of the strings. Some of the strings. Satan shows you the bait and hides the hook. He gets you to look at the short-term pleasure of what this will do while hiding the long-term misery it'll create for you. It's one of the strings he tries to get to vibrate in your life. By getting you to rationalize sin as virtue. So you say, I'm not greedy, I'm thrifty. I'm not really nosy, I'm just concerned. I'm not an alcoholic, I'm just sociable. By showing you the sin of Christian leaders. So you say to yourself, he did it too, nobody's really that pure. By overstressing the mercy of God. So you say to yourself, do it. God will forgive you, that's his job. By making them bitter over suffering, so you say, I've had it hard, I've suffered, I deserve this. This is why people in powerful positions fall. I've had it hard. Nobody knows how hard I've had it. I've worked hard. Nobody knows. I've sacrificed everything to get here, so I deserve this. By getting you to compare one part of your life to another. So Satan will get you to say, I'm really good over here and here and here, so it's okay if I do this over here. An extreme form of that is mafia hitmen. I'm good to my mother. Okay, I kill people, but I'm good to my mother. I'm really good to my mother. He's playing you. He's playing you. He knows what strings you've got. Don't be unaware of the devil's schemes. Now look closely at verse 9. Resist him. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. You know, when Peter mentions the fact that other Christians are dealing with this too, I don't think he's just being informative. I think he's using this to encourage something. Spiritual alertness, spiritual vigilance is best achieved in relationship with other believers. Christian solidarity is a resource for resoluteness in spiritual alertness. In other words, spiritual alertness is a team sport. 
You want me to boil this down? We need each other to make it to the end. You need other believers in your life to make it to the end. Do you have a friend who prays with you and for you regularly? You know, you've all watched nature shows. I grew up watching Marty Stauffer's Wild America on PBS. You remember that show? Huh? The rams that butt heads at the end of the introduction. As a little kid, that's what I lived for. <laughs> Here they go. They're a dime a dozen. These kinds of shows are a dime a dozen. I was watching one that had a herd of water buffalo and six lions. And uh, the lions were plotting to have buffalo for dinner. They found one buffalo that had strayed from the herd, maybe a couple hundred yards, and then they went after it. The buffalo is sprinting as fast as it can. So how do a few lions stop a buffalo? One lion grabbed onto the back leg, another lion grabbed onto the other back leg, and they just hung on until it slowed to a stop, then one lion hopped on his back, another went after the stomach, and from there you can visualize what happened. Here's what's very interesting about this story, and maybe I was just in a humorous mood at the time. There were perhaps a hundred buffalo, if not more, all standing and staring, watching this go down. I don't know if buffalo can think. <laughs> But if a buffalo could think, you know what I think they're thinking? <laughs> Boy, am I ever glad that's not happening to me. <laughs> I mean, imagine if the herd collectively had decided, you know what, we're not going to let this happen. We're going to charge them together. All of us, all 100, 200 of us. You know what would happen? The lions would go running off. They'd scurry away. There's a lesson for us. Satan's a lion. His first objective is to separate somebody from the herd. He makes them mad at the church and Christians or angry for some other reason or just simply gets them more interested in other things. And once they're away from the herd, he intensifies his attack. And then when we hear of the spiritual demonic struggles that a person faces, we say to ourselves, boy, am I ever glad that's not me. What we have to do as a congregation is hang together. Stay close to the herd. Stay close to the herd. To make it through this fiery ordeal and arrive safely in the presence of God, we're going to need spiritual alertness, energized by Christian solidarity. It doesn't let this prowling lion separate individuals from the herd. Christ-like leadership, a culture of humility, spiritual alertness. As we conclude this series, remember Peter's words to you in his opening salvo. In all this adversity, in all this unjust suffering... These, those sufferings have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. The fiery trials that besiege us are purposeful to test the genuineness of our faith. The very faith that will one day result in your praise, glory, and honor when Jesus is revealed. Let's pray. Loving and gracious God, we embrace our identity as aliens, exiles, pilgrims, sojourners, who inhabit two worlds simultaneously. Give us grace that we need to properly locate our hope, not in an idealized life this side of heaven, but in the inheritance, the living hope, the salvation, ready to be revealed on the last day. When the opposition closes in to ridicule or persecute in some way, I pray that we would consider it joy 
to join Jesus in the fellowship of his sufferings, that our faith may be proven genuine. Above all else, Father, I pray that you'd fill our minds and hearts with anticipation for the life you've prepared for us when eternity dawns. A life created through the perfect life Jesus lived and agonizing suffering he endured in our place. Oh God, we look forward to this great day when our faith will become sight. On our journey there, God, continue to strengthen our faith. To the glory of Christ, we pray these things. Amen.